concerning governance or politics. So it's a, it's an initiative that helps citizens to kind of uh, approach or be more familiar with governance and politics. And our focus for the past several months has been the constitutional reforms. And uh, we were in close cahoots with uh, Blogging Ghana and 233 Law and uh, were supported recently by Star Ghana. So uh, you'll be hearing quite a bit from us uh, till December. I've been wondering to myself where that stage uh, has gotten to right now, where, where we've got into regarding what the reforms. Yes, yeah. reforms. Do you have an idea where we've got into? Um, I don't think that beyond those those who last handled it, anybody else really knows where it is. Because um, we've been asking a lot of questions from uh, the parliamentarians, from uh, persons close to the executive, the attorney general, and nobody wants to say for sure where exactly it is. But we do know that the process, as it was, you know, explained to all Ghanaians that, you know, this is how it's going to go, has been stalled. And it's also become very mute. You know, we have no idea what's happening. And which is uh, one of the reasons why One Simple Step began pushing for this educational uh, and awareness create, creating project because um, the constitution is really what determines our rights, our limitations, you know, our thresholds from whoever is aware of it to whoever is unaware of it. It's the document that, um, you know, makes you uh, and determines what you are about. So um, we found it a very pertinent project when it was started, and it was started as far back as 2010. Um, four years down the road, we still have not gone to the end of this exercise, and it's an exercise that really should have given us a great opportunity to improve the law concerning, you know, uh, or let me say regarding the fact that it impacts everybody from the current state of, um, you know, unhappiness that workers are displaying over to uh, how our leadership handles our issues, to our state expenditures, to every little aspect of our lives. This, this document handles it. If we had the opportunity to improve it, uh, we should really have, you know, happily passed it through. But the second... Isn't that the very reason why it shouldn't be rushed? It is. I mean, if it would take us even a decade to get this to... Your own point. To get it right. Your own point. Your own point. Um, and and one of the reasons why we were concerned was that uh, we should even at least know what the final amendments were. When it came out, it wasn't very public. It's still not very public. But from what I have seen so far, the amendments being asked for really don't really contribute anything crucial to our state of affairs. Why do you say so? Um, for instance. We should be having the right to elect our own DCs and our own mayors because that is, I think, the first step to cleaning up the mess that we are encountering as a country. If you elect somebody from your own district, elected by your own people, you're more liable to deliver. You're more liable to have some progress. We don't have that right yet. You know, People are selected. We only have the right to uh, select one person in the district assembly. But the district chief executive, him or herself, we don't have the right to pick. We don't have the right to uh, vote for a mayor. And then also, um, there's something called a citizen's initiative, or also known as popular initiative. And uh, even, you know, Burkina Faso has that, Uganda has that, Kenya has that. And that is where citizens have the right to sign a petition. Let's say 30,000, 1 million registered voters sign a petition and present it to, you know, either parliament or the president, by law, they should be looked at. That petition should be taken and worked with. It should even lead to a referendum to amend the constitution. It should lead to changes in law. You know, that kind of initiative is nowhere in our constitution. But at the moment, we have three at least ways by where the process can be initiated, which some will say it's sufficient. We have that which can be initiated by the president. Mm -hmm. um, that is, I think, Article 108. We have by parliament, and then also by the Council of State. I mean, yeah. why a popular initiative? Um, I don't know how much power the uh, parliamentarians have for initiating such things, especially when it comes to the entrenched amendments that one looks at. Um, the, the, the executive has more of the power, but even that, you know, we found that with the... But 
executive has the power in the final seat. Yes. But at least parliament has an opportunity has to an debate opportunity. it on the floor of parliament. But if you think about it, even this current referendum, if it will happen, totally sidelines parliament. Well, maybe not totally, but not mostly. Totally. So they don't have the right to see what the final bill says. But they have a right to influence whatever bill gets to the president finally. I don't know about that. The cabinet, the council of state has the say, you know, to advise on it. So what happened was that this bill was brought out. Then it was sent to the Speaker of Parliament. Speaker of Parliament sent it to Council of State for advice. Council of State and the executive are the two people who have the right to say anything about it. So from Council of State, it's supposed to go to the Gazette office, which is where we are at now. We don't know where exactly it is. It's been several months. So let's say it goes to the Gazette office. It's there for six months. When it comes out, Parliament still has no right to say anything about it. It's but supposed to come straight to the, the country. Gazette stage, uh, if you look at the mode of exercising uh, the legislative power, mm -hmm. Article 1064, mm -hmm. it says that committees of Parliament shall be charged mm -hmm. with such functions, including the, the investigation and inquiry into the activities and mm -hmm. administration of uh, ministries, departments, etc. But here, yeah, that's why I find it more instructive. Yeah. And such investigations and inquiries may extend to proposals for legislation. Mm -hmm. It continues also to say that, you know, whatever bill... Mm -hmm. This article one with three, whatever bill is read yeah. the first time in parliament, that is the point at which it comes to parliament, mm -hmm. shall be referred to the appropriate committees appointed under article one with three of this constitution, mm -hmm. which shall examine the bill in detail, mm -hmm. shall examine the bill in detail mm -hmm. and such inquiries uh, in relation to it. So I'm thinking but, at that point, but it yeah, are they talking about generic issues as in when they talk about bills? You know, are they talking about the bills that? you know, come through Parliament or they're referring to something of this sort which has to do with the Constitution and trends and unentrenched. So, as opposed to because the because the, the Constitution does say it, it defines exactly, you know, what the process should be. And uh, it, it says that um, the process that should be followed okay. when uh, one wants to amend anything is that, you know, it, it gets the Speaker, Speaker sends it to Council of State, you know, Gazette Office. Parliament has uh, very little to do with it for any kind of referendum. They don't have any, any such thing. Um, so, so, you know, it, it is a problem. And like you said before, it should not be rushed. I think our concern is not that it should happen quickly. Uh, it, it, our concern is more of the fact that the two issues I mentioned are nowhere within the consideration of this bill that's supposed to lead to the referendum. We need to have that right to vote the DCs and mayors. We need to have that right for a citizen's initiative or a popular you know, initiative for people to have that. If for nothing at all, we should have that. But also the fact that it's been said, and I don't know for sure if it's true, but it's been said that the aim is to have all the 41 amendments put together on one single ballot vote, as in vote yes for all of it, or no for all of it. We will get to that, but I just want to uh, bring in uh, uh, Professor Kwesi Prempe, who is yeah. a foremost constitutional lawyer. He joins us on the line. Good morning, Prof. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, yes, I've been having this conversation with Golda. We've talked about who should initiate the process and some of the challenges that her group uh, one simple step sees with the constitution review process so far. What has been your assessment of the exercise up until this stage? Uh, well, thank you for the opportunity. Um, the process issues uh, surrounding the amendment to the Constitution are, are actually uh, quite significant and, and, and important. Uh, usually, uh, process uh, has a way of informing and shaping the, the content of the final, final document. So process does inform substance, oftentimes. And for me, because this is the first time we're doing this, this provides a precedent. How, how we do it this first time around sets the precedent by which we amend our constitution, at least uh, pertaining to the uh, um, entrenched clauses, in the future. So for me, this is very important, and that is why we ought to get it right the first time. Uh, so much energy, I think, and ink has been spent on the very legalistic arguments one way or the other. I think that really misses the point. Uh, there's really not a whole lot of legal certainty, one way or the other. Uh, our constitution, the way it's been drafted pertaining to the amendment process, is fairly ambiguous in 
many important respects. For example, on the question of who initiates, uh, there are arguments on both sides. You mentioned three possibilities. Um, in fact, all three bodies that you mentioned, President, Parliament, Council of State, uh, have the power uh, to trigger um, the provision pertaining to uh, uh, the establishment of a commission of inquiry. But the question becomes, is, is really the provision pertaining to commission of inquiry the one that should govern this process? Currently, I think this is before the Supreme Court. Uh, it will be litigated very, very soon. But I think that where you, you have ambiguity in the text, in an issue like this, then the real issue becomes uh, we can then uh, basically resolve the matter by resorting to policy arguments. If we're not so clear on the law, on the text, then we should ask ourselves what is the proper thing to do? If the law could go either way, for the time being, since this is a decision setting moment, what is the proper thing to do? Is it the proper thing to do for a president to initiate this process? And I think if you look at it from the policy angle, then it appears to be that a president would be the worst possible candidate to initiate a process for amending uh, the Constitution, especially the entrenched provisions. I say this because if you look at the history, we came to this idea of entrenching certain clauses in the Constitution and making them um, uh, amendable only by referendum. Sometime back in the 1960s, that's when we went, we, we, we decided to go this way. Based on the experiences that we had, we had suffered uh, with respect to constitutional changes from 1957 to 1966. On the basis of that experience, when we had another opportunity at making a constitution, we decided that certain provisions are fairly sacrosanct and that we would immunize them against uh, presidential manipulation by entrenching them. In fact, in 1969 constitution, some were even made unamendable. They were immutable provisions in the constitution. So since that time, we have really maintained this tradition of keeping certain provisions very difficult to amend. And essentially, the person from whom we're keeping them uh, from being easily amendable is really the president, based on our history. So, for example, we keep almost all the provisions pertaining to executive very difficult to amend, the judiciary, very difficult to amend, fundamental rights and freedoms, very difficult to amend. And there's a history behind that. So I think it really almost flies in the face of that history. If we then begin a new practice in the Fourth Republic of letting the president be the one person who determines when we amend the Constitution, whether we amend it, who amends it, what commission amends it, how we amend it, I think that that history is important and we shouldn't go against it. There's also another reason why presidents do not make the best candidates for initiating this process. And it is that a president is a single individual. All of the executive power of the state is vested in this one person. But that one person, given our practice, can only be elected to the ticket of one political party. A constitutional amendment process is a national project. It should be seen as a national project and should be delinked from any one political party. Unfortunately, when you make the president the person who sets the ball rolling, who sets the agenda for the reform, it becomes difficult to actually disentangle this national project from the political identity of that president. So it takes on a certain partisan coloration when it shouldn't, because this is indeed a national project. Um, not to cut you uh, unduly, but if you look at the, the problems which can be identified with the president initiating this, uh, this process, sure. the question of partisanship, abuse of incumbency, etc., mm -hmm. don't you find similar political challenges even within the various spheres? If you take it to parliament, for example, the nature of our parliament, how it's constituted now, don't you find the same problems there? And even in the case of the popular vote, uh, the popular uh, initiative. initiative that is being proposed, don't you still see the problem in there? Uh, even perhaps even worse than this, because you'll be dealing with the masses who, uh, I believe, it comes to just voting, the balloting issues that we have, the question of illiteracy, etc. Aren't we just extending the bureaucracies and the options that don't necessarily cure the problem of partisanship? 
no, I don't, I don't, I don't think that we have we have the same problems uh, in equal measure. Certainly, no alternative is devoid of its 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 uh, its disadvantages or its demerits. But I don't think that uh, the other alternatives are, are flawed uh, with equal measure. Now, if you take the Parliament, for example, assuming that. Parliament was the one that initiated this process. Parliament is a multi-party institution, represents diverse political interests, represents interests that cut across the country. Um, if you have Parliament initiated, as is frequently done in many countries, including in Africa, what you would, what we would envisage would be, for example, the Parliament will start off this process with an act of Parliament that sets up a commission. In that act of Parliament you would have the process by which the commission should be composed. It would be, for example, nomination by political parties, nomination from civil society, nomination by identifiable bodies, you know, maybe uh, uh, some persons chosen by the president, some persons chosen by just named, named entities. That kind of process would, from the very beginning, give this whole question, this whole process, a certain buy-in politically. You would have broad political consensus as well as some measure of social consensus within civil society as to how we set this ball rolling, rather than give it to one person who then, in his own judgment, handpicks uh, uh, people based on his own criteria. And it's important to, uh, to, to emphasize that we should not focus on this particular process and how this particular one has been done, right? The real question is, this sets a precedent. So how we do it this time, if we come to accept that it is the president who sets it rolling, then it means that it, it is only the president who at any one time can determine whether do we need a constitutional reform or do we not? Should we do it or should we not? Well, the persons and, and, and the, the interest in the country that are interested in how the constitution is organized extend beyond the president. So there should be at least opportunity for other entities to weigh in in this question and to trigger the process. The popular initiative, again, not devoid of, um, of, of problem, but it is also the case that the constitution provides the rules of the game by which the political class governs us, by which we are governed by the political class uh, of the country to leave it solely to that class, whether it's parliament or the president or even the council of state, which is okay. part of the establishment. That, that point is understood. Only to these bodies to determine when or whether we will have an amendment is to leave it to the same people about whom these rules are really are, are deeply affected in terms of their power. It is to leave it to them to determine Surely. Let's look at the, uh, the, the, the entrenched, uh, we had press for time, I'm sorry, but let's look at the entrenched uh, uh, provisions. There have been some questions regarding how the questions of the proposed amendments have been framed. Right. Um, there are some 34 clauses, uh, old and seven new clauses, which are going to be looked at. But right. what, in your view, is the problem with how we have framed the question? Well, as, as initially, currently, I don't know. It's not gone to the the, the uh, it's not gone to that stage yet where it's been framed as a question. But from the proposal that the proponents of the amendment initially uh, released, it appears that it was their anticipation that all 41 proposals would be posed as a single ballot question. Uh, for voters to vote yes or no to that question. Now, the problem with doing it that way is that these 41 proposals are, for the most part, unrelated to one another. Right? So you have proposals that would seek to abolish the death penalty. You have proposals affecting the right to vote. You have proposals dealing with consumer rights. You have proposals dealing with the monuments of president and other, other officials. You have proposals dealing with how appointments to the EC and the uh, and, uh, strides must be made, whether to bring in Parliament or not. Now, these are very different proposals. And when you lump all of this together as one bill and pose it to the voters as the question, what that does, again,
we were talking precedently, right? The precedent you are setting is this. You are able then to couple unpopular measures with popular measures in one bill and let the unpopular measures ride on the back of the popular measures. So let me give you an example. Assuming, and this is not the case currently, but if the practice begins and becomes a precedent, assuming that we allow this practice to be established, that you can lump provisions together that are unrelated and pose this as a single, single question. So I am the president. I, I, I become, I decide that I want to extend my term in office. I want uh, three or four terms for the president instead of two. I realize that it's an unpopular measure. You long roll it together. You put it all together I, so that in I one vote, it we with, pass I it all. Together with a proposal but, that says uh, all unemployed Ghanaians shall receive a cash payment. That is understood. Month. But yes. talking about precedents, yes. isn't that how the 1992 constitution in itself was best? That yes. we locked it all exactly. together. Yes. So it isn't right. exactly new. That's exactly how we do constitutions. When you are doing a new constitution, you are presenting the people with a clear choice between the status quo, the current state of affairs they are in with a particular regime, and the proposed state of affairs that you are going into it under the new constitution. There's a clear choice between... Do you want this new constitution in 1992, which is going to bring you multi-party civilian democracy uh, with all of these features in it? Or do you want, if you say no, you get stuck with the status quo, which is you stay in a military regime. There's a clear choice. There's, even though the new constitution has 300, so-called, almost 299 provisions, all of that together stands for one thing. You can say that it stands for one thing. It stands for a new constitution with constitutional democracy, with rights and freedoms, you can actually describe what it is you are voting for. You cannot do the same thing when you are amending a constitution and you get 41 different provisions lumped together as one that are unrelated. I do not, if you tell me what do the amendments stand for, they don't present a clear choice for me. They don't stand for any particular state of affairs in the future. They don't represent any one thing I can describe. So there's a big difference between when you are replacing an entire, entire, entire uh, regime with a new constitutional regime and you are telling people to vote for that one constitution of several parts together as one. That presents them with a clear, definitive choice that they can describe and that they are aware of. But when you do it this way, it's a very different process. So we should see them as two different things completely separate. Okay. Um, uh, Prof, thank you very much for uh, this explanation. It's really educating. But uh, let me come to Golda, and this really may be my final question to you. Going forward, what is the plan of the One Simple Step team uh, to help enhance the public awareness regarding this process? Um, the, the plan has to be a dynamic one because we realize we're dealing with quite a lot of issues here. Um, what we are definite about is that we're moving around the country and we're doing quite a lot of interactions. But the one main thing that we want most listeners to have in mind is that the project is not aimed at, you know, uh, causing any unrest or, you know, uh, bashing anybody's work. What we are interested in is assuring or, you know, uh, affirming the position of... Uh, uh, this statement, which was made by Cicero, I think, and it says, true law is right reason in agreement with nature. It is of universal application and changing and everlasting. It summons to duty by its commands and averts from wrongdoings by its prohibitions. Our concern is that too much power has been placed within the executive, maybe not by anybody's fault. Just about uh, time we decentralize power. Yeah, it's about time we decentralize it because the, the, the thing is that um, um, the executive has probably more power than is necessary to direct the course of government. And, well, I'll uh, say your, your course is uh, pretty well supported by the directive principles of state policy, uh, which are calling for this. So we wish you all the best thank of luck you. in this uh, endeavor. And a special thank you also to you, Professor H. Kwesi Prempe, foremost constitutional uh, law expert. It's been such a pleasure speaking to you.